Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the lives of Robert and Stephen Spahowski from New York. On the 12th of December 1954, identical twins Robert and Stephen were born. They were the only children born to Bernard and Anita Spahowski and grew up in Elmira, New York. Details about their childhood are scarce, but it is known that their parents divorced when the boys were around 12 years old, after which they were raised only by their mother. The family lived in a three-bedroom house at Bower Road in West Elmira and attended school at the nearby Elmira Free Academy. Both boys were strong and athletic and they were also very good at gymnastics. Robert was on both the gymnastic and track teams. The pair were very close growing up, were sociable with their peers and they liked to party. By the time they were in their mid-teens, their descent into a life of crime had already begun. In July 1971, at the age of 16, Robert was arrested and charged with driving a stolen car after being stopped by the police in Elmira. Just a few weeks later, he was charged with felony arson after he set fire to the stage curtain at his high school. By October of that year, he had been sentenced to 15 weekends in jail after he pled guilty to the car charges from July. The following month, on 24th of November 1971, Mrs. Ida Ziegler found her 48-year-old son-in-law, Ronald Ripley, in the basement of his store. The store was called the Salad Master Kitchen and it was in Elmira Heights. Ronald had been stabbed to death. The police investigation established that witnesses had seen Ronald in the store at 320 East 14th Street at around 11.30pm the previous evening. A witness came forward to state that they had seen Ronald driving at around 11.45pm and when Ronald's car was found abandoned behind Jim's Grocery and the car wash near Fitch's Bridge in West Elmira. The police search began to focus on whether Ronald had offered a hitchhiker a lift. It was then established that Ronald's assailant had crept up behind him in the store before striking him on the head with a hammer. He was then stabbed to death. Already known to the police, Stephen was questioned as part of the inquiry, but was not considered a suspect in the case. The following month, Robert was again in trouble with the law, this time for criminal trespass, and by 1972, Robert had been incarcerated in Shemung County Jail due to a parole violation. Meanwhile, the investigation into Ronald's murder continued, and as more evidence was discovered, the police once again brought Stephen in for questioning. At this point, Stephen admitted killing Ronald, claiming that it was because Ronald had made unwanted sexual advances towards him. On the 4th of May 1972, Stephen was arraigned on the charge of murder and sent to Shemun County Jail, where his brother was also being held. Stephen was represented by the public defender Samuel Castellino. He pled guilty to manslaughter, thus avoiding a trial. Robert was released, but was soon in trouble with the law again. In July 1973, he was found guilty of stealing $3,000 worth of cash and equipment from a music store in Elmira. He received a five-year prison sentence, but served only two years. The crimes continued, and in July 1976, Robert was charged with third-degree burglary after breaking into a high school in Elmira. Again, he received a prison sentence, this time for two to five years. He was sent to the Auburn Correctional Facility where his brother Stephen was serving his sentence. At the time, the two men looked identical. In July of 1978, when prison inmates were servicing an old army truck, either Stephen or Robert tried to escape in a hidden compartment under the truck. The escape attempt was foiled after prison officials were tipped off and it was reported that, because the corrections officials were unable to tell which brother had attempted to escape, they threw them both into solitary confinement. At the time, neither brother would confirm who was involved, but it was later reported that Stephen claimed that it was Robert. The following year, in November 1979, Robert was released from prison and started a job as a mechanics helper. However, this period of going straight did not last long. 
Less than two years later, in July 1981, he was charged, together with an accomplice by the name of Roger Saxbury, with stealing a coin collection rumoured to be worth around $15,000. This would be worth approximately $57,000 now. The following month he pled guilty to this crime and was again sentenced to two to five years in prison. Upon his release in December 1984, he moved to Rochester, New York. Rochester has one of the highest crime rates and fastest declining populations in the US. Throughout his life, Robert had become increasingly dependent upon illegal drugs and by the 1990s, he had become a sex worker in order to fund his addiction to crack cocaine. On the 2nd of October 1991, Robert was stopped by the police whilst driving a 1980 Plymouth Valair. When questioned, Robert told the police that he was the owner of the car and that his name was Charles Grande, a local landscape company owner. He was sent on his way. Two days later, on the 4th of October 1991, 40-year-old Charles Grande's body was found in the bedroom at his home. He had been beaten to death with a hammer. The police suspected that Robert was responsible for the murder, but did not have enough evidence to charge him. He was, however, charged with criminal impersonation, a charge from which he was acquitted in August 1992. Over the years, he continued to have run-ins with the law and further arrests, charges and prison sentence followed for burglary, robbery and drug-related offences. His twin, Stephen, was released from prison in 1999. Within a few months, he was back behind bars after violating the terms of his parole. Several years later, in November 2005, Robert walked into the police headquarters in Rochester, New York. He walked to the front desk and told the officer that a few days earlier, he had murdered his neighbor, 54-year-old Vivian Irizari. Vivian had been one of Robert's closest friends and lived in the apartment next to him at Spencer Street in Rochester. Robert told the police that he and Vivian had been sharing a hundred dollar bag of crack cocaine when he had begun to hallucinate. He saw Vivian as a demon and freaked out, stabbing her multiple times. When Robert came down from his high, he saw Vivian convulsing and suffering. However, instead of calling for help, he decided that her wounds were fatal and choked her to death to end her suffering. He then bathed her and moved her body to the basement where it was cooler. It is believed that Robert felt guilty about the killing, leading to his confession, and he told the police how he would visit the body to cry and apologize to his friend. However, that was not the end of Robert's confession. He then went on to state how this was not his first murder. On the 31st of December, 1990, he had sex with 24-year-old Moraine Armstrong, a woman who lived in the house opposite him on Lake Avenue in Rochester. When Moraine demanded money from him in return, Robert went into a rage as he did not feel that he had to pay as he had shared his cocaine with her. In an explosion of temper, he choked her to death with an electrical cord. He made no attempt to hide Moraine's body and, when the police discovered the murder, he loitered around the scene talking to them about how he knew the victim. And then another confession followed. Seven months after Moraine's murder, Robert killed again. On the 21st of July 1991, Robert's girlfriend, Adrienne Berger, was found dead in her home at Emerson Street. The heating in her apartment was on, and together with the heat wave at the time, her body was badly decomposed by the time it was discovered. As such, a cause of death could not be established, and her death was never investigated. Robert still wasn't finished. He went on to tell the police how, a year after he had killed Adrienne, he struck again. Robert confessed to the 1991 killing of 40-year-old Charles Grande a crime that he had been the prime suspect in after being found in the victim's car. Despite being the prime suspect in the murder, the police had never been able to get enough evidence to charge him. Robert stated that Charles had become a regular client of his, trading sex in return for drug money. He said that Charles had attempted to shortchange him and as a result, Robert beat Charles to death with a hammer. Around the time of these killings, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, there were many other unsolved murders in the area near Lake Avenue and Lyle Avenue in Rochester. This is the same area where serial killer Arthur Shawcross, known as the Genesee River Killer, picked up at least 11 of his victims. In addition, another suspected serial killer, 
John White, who was believed to be responsible for up to five murders, was operating in the same area at that time. John died of a heart attack before he could face trial. Serial killers are thankfully very rare, so having three independent killers in the same area at the same time is unheard of and obviously had a huge impact on the many ongoing investigations. Robert's confessions matched the physical evidence and witness testimonies in all of these crimes. With many similar unsolved murders, he soon became a person of interest in many more cases, all of which he claims to have not been involved in. It has been reported that Robert is strongly suspected of being involved in the following murders. 21-year-old Demeter Gibson disappeared while walking home in 1991. Her body was found alongside railway tracks behind J Street five days later. She had been strangled and stabbed. Her mother later stated that she had seen Robert with her daughter. 26-year-old Cassandra Carlton and 25-year-old Katrina Myers were also found strangled and naked near railway tracks near Lyle Avenue. 30-year-old Victoria Jobson disappeared from her apartment in Lake Avenue in October 1992. Robert lived in the same building. Her body was found off of Lyle Avenue. She was naked and had been stabbed to death. 45-year-old Hortense Greatheart was strangled in her apartment in Lake Avenue in a building where Robert also lived. The heat in her apartment had also been turned to maximum, similar to that in the murder of Adrienne Berger. One year after making his confessions, Robert asked the judge to rule that these could not be used at trial. Robert's argument was that in 1991, his lawyer had told the police that he could not be questioned in relation to any murders without legal representation. In 2005, when he walked into the police station, he provided these confessions without any lawyer present, which he claimed made them inadmissible in court. In September 2006, the judge ruled that the confessions were admissible as there was no evidence that the police in 2005 would have any knowledge of the past letter. Initially, the defence strategy was that Robert was not guilty by reason of insanity, but when the trial actually began in November 2006, they pursued a different defence. His attorney, Joseph D'Amelio, stated that Robert had been a drug addict his entire adult life and was suffering from extreme emotional disturbance. Joseph argued that as Robert was high on crack cocaine during the killings, he could not form intent to kill. He went on to state that Robert had been questioned for 12 straight hours by the police without access to the medication which he took four times a day. This medicine was for his mental health problems. The prosecutor, however, stated that the brutality of the murders and Robert's detailed description of them during the confession showed beyond a doubt that he knew what he was doing. The jury deliberated for less than two and a half hours before finding Robert guilty on all counts. The prosecutor argued that due to the violent nature of his crimes, he should never be released from prison. In December 2006, he was sentenced to 100 years in state prison. When given the opportunity to speak, he said, I would like to say to the families, I apologize. I'm very sorry. He will spend the rest of his life behind bars. There are some reports which state that the brothers were in a deadly competition with each other. However, I've been unable to find anything to support this. On the contrary, it has been reported that when Stephen heard about his brother's crime while still in prison himself, he stated that he thought he was the only killer in the family. That concludes our video for today. I would be really grateful if you could subscribe and like the video. As always, please add any comments down below. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. The Oxygen Channel featured these twins in their Killer Siblings series.